How's everyone doing? That's excellent. Okay, if we could all do that now. That's spectacular. I'll just wait for the room to a couple more minutes, seconds here and we'll create a little environment to talk about international and commerce. So you're, you're probably noticing that our um, panel's a little bare than anticipated. Uh, with me on my immediate left is Andrew Muroff, and on my right is uh, Linus Weber. And my, I'm Robert Laurie, and uh, well, we are missing uh, Mr. Tom Zuber, and uh, who I'm, I'm, I'm told had some fr flight complications, and uh, Clint Young, unfortunately, is uh, really under the weather. So what we thought we would do, given that there's just three of us, our panel discussion is really more going to be, I would call it a fireside chat, and we should have enough room for questions, and uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll kick it off. So Canada, as we all know, has been in the world leader in international cannabis market being that it's the first G7 country to federally create a regime devoted to legalization. But competition is certainly ramping up as other countries legalize, and uh, we're seeing a whole bunch of different models. Um, from Uruguay, Israel, the Netherlands, Germany, Australia, I could go on, Thailand, Every day there seems to be another country either decriminalizing, legalizing, or introducing some form of regulation. And uh, with that being said, uh, why don't we just take a moment, you two, well, we'll start with Mr. Uh, Muroff. Introduce yourself and just take us through, you know, the, your involvement with international cannabis, and then we'll hear from Linus. All right. Thanks for having me. Glad to be on the stage with both of you. And the other guys missed out, so they're a loss. Um, my name is Andrew, and uh, I'm the CEO of Strain Print Technologies. We capture patient-reported outcomes from medical cannabis patients who um, are treating with legal product mainly. And uh, we deliver that anonymous data back to the industry. We have the largest data set of its kind uh, in the world today, over 1.4 million patient-reported outcomes. We're Toronto-based, we're a Canadian company, and um, we service today Canada, the US, Israel, uh, and hopefully uh, soon in the European Union. Right on, Linus. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name's Linus, I'm from Germany, uh, uh, founder and CEO of Nimbus Health, a fully licensed pharmaceutical wholesaler. Um, We've been in the business since July only, uh, started two years ago, sort of starting building up the um, yeah, connections to um, producers outside uh, the European Union, now also inside European, I'm very keen to see how the market, especially in the European Union, evolves now uh, as more and more producers coming in. But of course, challenging, uh, uh, challenges are rising also on the Canadian side. Let's see how uh, the US are uh, moving. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, the domestic supply in Germany is not enough, at least for the next four years. So uh, we are heavily uh, reliant on uh, you producing and uh, importing uh, together with us, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Those are both great answers and certainly give us a platform to uh, build on. Uh, as I indicated earlier, my name is Robert Laurie, and uh, well, I, by trade, I'm an international lawyer. I'm licensed in England in Wales and uh, here in British Columbia and I studied law at Oxford. And my previous life I was a securities fraud lawyer and um, a hedge fund formation lawyer which developed a, th a great understanding of onshore, offshore tax arbitrage. And that's effectively what we're starting to see more and more are companies that are structuring their operations in manners which are tax efficient. And uh, I would like to, I guess, put out to both of you the question as, um, what is driving your, your, your respective businesses? Is it following Canada as an example, or is it other considerations such as tax efficiencies? 
wondering if you might be able to comment. Let's start with Linus this time. Well, uh, basically, if you look, look at the history for Germany in 1998, we had stronabinol, which is a purely THC compound, which was sort of given to patients. Since 2003, we have flowers already from, uh, from uh, the Netherlands, so there has been already a market for it. However, in 2017, it became possible to reimburse medicinal cannabis by the health insurance of the people in Germany. And this was sort of the game changer. We are now ramping up in the last two and a half years. It's only 70,000 patients. But this is due to the fact that we um, don't have the ed education of the doctors. So um, sort of copying on the one side from the um, medicinal space, yeah, basically as an experiment in Europe from everyone, so a little bit from Canada, in the United States, and so on and so forth. But in the end, um, we need more doctor's education, and this is something we should start copying uh, more efficiently, um, sort of opening up the world um, of, the, yeah, of cannabis to our doctors in Germany to be able to sort of bring more patients in, because we have 70,000 patients, and I think the potential is between 800,000 and 1.6 million, uh, because um, it's roughly one to 2% of the population of Germany. Interesting, Andrew? Um, we track uh, patient performance against lab verified product, and in most jurisdictions, you don't have even a testing requirement uh, today. So um, the key to us understanding the science behind what works and what doesn't is to be able to identify which chemical constituents are are correlated to what symptomatic improvement and drilling down by cohort, by age, by, ge by gender, and being able to see that 35-year-old women react to certain chemical profiles different than 50-year-old men, for example. So if we think about other jurisdictions where uh, the U.S. Has an, is a good example, uh, every state is an island, every state has its own regulatory regime for how they, um, both how they grow as well as how they test. So. For me, it's about uh, taking the experiences from Canada uh, with lab verified products and uh, the, those, the data that's related to those lab verified products and, and translating that into foreign markets where um, we haven't actually tested local product there, but we know that chemical profile uh, aligns to, um, to personality. So uh, even in Europe today, um, there's, as we know, there's very little product there, so we have an opportunity right now to take what we know and we've had the fortune to do that here in Canada only because the regulations are the way they are. So I think we, we actually, from my perspective, we had a great advantage here that the regs were so tight. Interesting. Well, an, an avenue that m you may not think about that certainly should come to mind in the discussion of international is, is certainly First Nations. Now, at the moment, as C45, the Cannabis Act stands, there is no information or guidance as to how First Nations should be setting up legal cannabis operations. We have to remember that First Nations are also technically a fourth level of government. And recently I was made a board member on the Zagame Assinibek First Nations Cannabis Board, which you're starting to see First Nations understanding that through their own process of self-determination, provided they are then endorsed by band and band council, they then are able to create infrastructure such as a cannabis board on their land and begin to engage in this process. But I have always thought that that could go a step further. Depending on the band, again, depending on the nation, if it's a J Treaty band, and again, that goes back to the late 1850s or so, which was a recognition of, by the US, Canadian, and British governments of the First Nations that were in existence at that time. And the stipulation was to recognize the free movement of people and goods. And I think, well, what I know is coming is that you're going to see a lot more First Nations exercising their self-determination in some form or another to realize a tax efficiency. And I started looking at this like six, seven years ago in my first legal aid case in Haida Gwaii. I was up there and they're talking about, you know, getting into the wine trade. And I was like, have you seen the wind? It's 180 like, miles an hour. You're going to be harvesting grapes in Prince Rupert. What about cannabis? Because ultimately, I looked at it as Haida Gwaii could very much be the Bermuda 
or the Bahamas of British Columbia with respect to an onshore, offshore arbitrage. So that I think we're going to see across the United States, First Nations engaging in self-determination, which could lead to international deals with the European market and with certainly cross-border. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it couldn't happen soon enough. I mean, we, there's, there's a massive opportunity in production and a massive opportunity in export once uh, a level of, uh, of um, compliance is reached. I think that's the big king right now is, is, is bringing uh, uh, production facilities on those lands up to, to the same level that are in. Uh, and that's not to say it can't be done. Of course it can be done. It's just, uh, it does, is it a priority right now? And it hasn't been up until now. But, but it, it will be. And, uh, and there is a lot of opportunity for product to, to cross borders that don't have the same level of export regulation that, say, uh, any, of, any of the big producers here today have. Right on. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's from always... From your European yeah, perspective on First exactly, Nations. Exactly. I mean, we have, uh, from, a, from a European standpoint, uh, and that's basically the word um, everybody heard of is the EU GMP certification process. And uh, Nick did it uh, uh, in, his, uh, in his speech um, uh, that there's like a huge effort to really reach that kind of certification. Um, we are engaging in that and I think there need to be clear standard ways of how to produce medicinal cannabis throughout the world. And this can only be done through collaboration. And I see that uh, this really urge for um, uh, collaboration in cannabis is there. I mean, my background is pharma. There wasn't like everybody was working in their little offices. Uh, and now with cannabis, we have the possibility to really do that co collaborative work in order to find really standards um, that would ease the export and ease also any processes in uh, sort of bringing products either from Canada uh, to other jurisdictions or also into Canada, I would say. Um, I mean, domestic supply in Germany is not enough, but uh, others will be ramping up, so there must be some kind of standardization in the process. Um, yeah, and that's what I think is the big challenge in the near future. Well, given there's a lot of products going from A to B and C and D and back to A probably, how are the products getting to their destinations? I'll just go ahead. I'll give an anecdote. I, I mean, go for it. I, I, I have BC product that I bought that got delivered to me in Ontario and I brought it back to BC. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, products are, are getting transported in a lot of different ways and uh, I, I think there's, um, there are both logistical issues, but there are regulatory issues. I don't, I don't even know uh, um, how we're ever going to get into the U.S. in the, in the near future, because uh, it's, it's very uh, exclusionary, for lack of a better word. I think it's a short-term problem, but it is what it is right now, so I don't think the U.S. market is going to be. But how do we get products into the U.K.? We were just talking about this earlier, or into the EU. Uh, if you can get into the market, is it transported by air? Is it transported by ship? Is it transported by rail? And we know that they have a, a prevalence for, for rail. So um, I'm just a data guy, but I'm just speaking observationally on what I see. So Linus, you get somehow this product comes from the Netherlands, makes its way to Germany. Do you want to take us through that? Exactly, and we actually are using uh, a normal uh, uh, transporter springing in from, from, from Betrocan. Basically, everybody knows that company. They're doing standardized medicinal cannabis products out of uh, the Netherlands. That's, uh, those are the ones which we are currently distributing in Germany. We are in discussion with several uh, Canadian companies already, but then this EU GMP certification comes in, um, where it sometimes gets really difficult, but we now have a GMP a uh, professional in our team really helps the companies to sort of ease that process, but I must admit, of course, it's uh, uh, from coming from Canada, it's always by plane. Um, uh, and we had the first plane arriving from Tilray in Germany uh, last week um, from Portugal. Um, so there are new, new countries coming in where we can build relationships also inside the European Union, which makes, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, but I mean, there are products coming in and there are possibilities and we are more than happy uh, to help you uh, understand what is needed to bring products to the German market uh, slash uh, the European market. Because once it's in the European Union, it's way easier, of course, uh, distributing it to other countries such as, for example, Spain, Italy, um, uh, Portugal also, but Portugal is now has a huge domestic growth. So I don't think there is export needed to Portugal.
So can I ask a question? To get it into uh, the EU, it's the same regardless of whether or not it's the end is going into Germany or going into Switzerland or... Yeah, it's, it's not as easy as that. So, um, of course, it's once you're inside the European Union, it's, it is easier to have the uh, export license as a European uh, company to export to a different uh, jurisdiction within the European Union. That's what's easier. Uh, because it's already um, yeah, checked by a qualified person, which is also in our team, um, and then it's also medical approved in Germany, which makes it easier to distribute to any other. The other way around, it's a bit more difficult because the Germans are always looking um, uh, very deeply into the processes and uh, check if everything is all right, but the other way around, it's, uh, it's more easy. Yeah. So, if, so if you're Canadian, you'd look for the easiest jurisdiction in the EU to get into, and then from there, you'd transfer it into Germany. That's an yeah. the biggest market. So I want to engage the audience. Just indulge me for one second. You've been a great audience here. With a yay or a nay, I'd like an honest answer. We'll see who's louder, I guess. Canada, cannabis regulations, are they over-regulated? Is that nay or yay? Okay, good. So we can continue, because if it went the other way, I don't think I could have asked the next question. Given that Canada had first mover advantage and has created a system that the rest of the world has been watching, some have even been adopting and applying, but do you feel that the standard in Canada has set itself too high that it'll be very hard for the government to come down to be competitive? So I guess the question is, has Canada in a way by being so cautious out of the gate has it kneecapped itself with respect to being truly competitive? I think, it's, I think it's actually been a boon for us because by setting the regulations so high, it's forced us to come to the table with real pharmaceutical type production facilities and really high quality product that no other jurisdiction would accept if we weren't at that state. So uh, I kind of look at it the other way. If we were, um, if we were like the US where the, the lens is really about commercialization and not about public safety, I don't think a, a country like Germany would even consider bringing it in without uh, the type of testing and experience level that we've had over these. And so, remember, we started out, the only reason why we're able to have that jump start into the European Union as an example is because we had a medical program. It has nothing to do with a recreational program. And the only reason we're able to go into foreign markets today is because of the medical program. Agreed. So uh, I don't think having a, a tight regs around the, the recreational program is is going to be a limitation. And I also think that it's way easier for the government in Canada to loosen the reins than it is for, for instance, in the U.S. Well, to that's go and if try they to tighten get things voted up. back in. What's that? That's if they get voted back in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, from a German perspective, I think um, there uh, can, I can't tell if Canada is overregulated my first time here, but um, Basically, what we see is um, a German would always do something rather not uh, than doing it wrong. Um, and that's why they are very cautious and careful by sort of importing products into Germany. And uh, nobody knows really how to do it right. Um, every local authority needs to do that uh, import license for the respective producers base, uh, or respective distributors. And uh, this is also based on uh, the place where you're located in Germany. For example, I'm from Hessen, Frankfurt, and we have three authorities which are sort of uh, overlooking the whole process. We have a narcotic, a narcotic agency who then in the end decides what is done. So we have, of course, huge regulations as well. Um, but it's um, sort of the processes are getting easier because they've been done a couple of times now. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, we are more than happy to assist. I think, as Nick said earlier, um, we, um, you should always go with a, with a good GMP consultant in order to be able to sort of overlook what is needed uh, before you end up having huge costs and uh, will not be able to bring products in. Hey, before we go to questions, um, is there anything in particular that we haven't covered that either of you'd like to share about the uniqueness of being ahead of the curve, if you will, with your business, and uh, be happy to yeah learn more about this. Uh, we were fortunate to be gathering data in 2016, so we had a, a pretty big head start in doing it. Now, um, we still have to deal with, as we go into international markets, we still have to deal with jurisdictional uh, transfer of data across borders. So. Um, Going into Europe, for example, we, uh, we have to be GN GDPR compliant, which um, is the privacy uh, regulation in, in that market. And if, 
if you will. Uh, in the US, there's HIPAA compliance. That's if we consider right here. Canadian uh, compliance is PIPIDA, and it's basically level compliance is here. And GDPR is way up here. So it, it's a big step up, and, and for us, uh, having a first mover advantage of gathering data and being cloud-based and only keeping and data only residing in Canada, never leaving the country on servers here. Uh, as we go into the UK or into Germany or anywhere in the in the EU, we have to be GDPR compliant, and uh, we are now. So uh, we're almost are now. Interesting. Sure. Right on. Okay, Linus, your thoughts. I think I think data is a it's a it's a big uh, big point, and that's where the game is changing. And that's I hope you're right. And when Israel also coming in, I think we heard, had it uh, already earlier in the conference where somebody was talking about Israel, um, how much data they're gathering, they're doing it for 20 years. I think this is really, really something what is uh, uh, important and needed. And I said it already in the beginning, collaboration is, is, is the key, uh, I would say, combining different uh, jurisdictions, uh, see what, what works. Uh, do experiments. I mean, uh, Germany is the experiment for Europe in terms of the patient numbers and uh, sort of inserting uh, or inserting products from all over the all over the world. Um, so yeah, um, I see I see data is key, uh, and uh, we should be exchanging more uh, more of the data. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward uh, maybe working more closely with you in the future. Yeah. Okay, yes or no answer to this question, and then we'll open it up to questions. Cannabis production, yes or no? Is it a race to the bottom? You're making me put me on the spot with well, that he's one. He's got I an mean, answer too. The, yeah, I mean, sadly, the reality is it is right now. Uh, I think it'll stabilize at some point, but uh, you know, at this point, every producer can sell everything that they grow. Uh, there's just so much demand. At some point, there'll be enough supply to service the market, and I don't know when that is, but at some point there'll be enough supply to service the market, and companies are gonna have to figure out how to differentiate their products from others. And it's a very hard market. I'm an IP lawyer, so it's very difficult to actually protect a particular cultivar, because somebody can just come up with a formulation that's slightly different, and it's no longer covered. Sir, the same question. Yes, yes and no. yeah, it, it, Just for an example, for Germany, uh, in 2018, we had 3.1 tons of cannabis flower material, which was distributed. This year, we are probably at five to six. Uh, next year, it's going to be again doubled, let's say 12 uh, tons for whole of Germany. And if I just see what amounts are currently grown, um, there will be a huge, and I'm, I'm not afraid, but it will be a huge challenge to sort of differentiate the different products. Uh, but let's look at Greece, where, there's, where there are 100 tons grown, uh, another uh, uh, Spain coming in, Portugal, Can Canada is there, nobody knows what's going to happen with the, uh, with the US in short notice. Um, so um, yeah, ch it, it's going to be a huge challenge uh, in terms also of the pricing and competitiveness, because there are also Eastern European uh, countries coming in, North Macedonia, Poland. Uh, which are produced at really, really low cost. So uh, let's see how it turns out. I don't have a uh, answer to that uh, question, but uh, yeah. Thank Those you are yes and no fight. answers, right? Yeah, uh, German yes and no. <laughs> it's very technical. Okay, are there any folks who... Let's hear it for the panel, first of all, right away. I have a, a quick question first. You mentioned IP as in respect to cannabis strains. How is it even possible? How do you how do you patent Trainwreck? How do you patent Bubba Kush? How do you patent Blue Dream? Like, I mean, cannabis strains have been With great open difficulty. source for the longest time, and I, I, it's just it's weird to me to see people you, try to. You, you, if anybody's ever done a patent before, you know, it's there. There's a there's a long process to it. It's years, and it costs a lot of money, and not everybody can afford to patent a, a strain. And if you were to take a particular if you went through the effort to genetically test your product, and, and that means beyond just you know CBD and THC, but if you actually go through the effort and look at the, the full chemical profile, um, and you patent that, that's great. You're going to spend fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars on that. It'll take a couple years, and then somebody's going to change the formulation by slightly one slight different amount, and then you're no longer covered. So I don't think it's patentable. Hi, um, I hear you guys talking. What about the Caribbean market? Because I know a lot of you guys are in the Caribbean right now, but I hear you mention nothing about the Caribbean market. Well, I also think the Antarctica market has potential, but we can't discuss everything. To answer your question, though, so, so I think that's a huge market, 
And unfortunately, none of us are technically working in that jurisdiction. Well, so, I know there are a lot of guys in the, in the region right now. Oh, I, I, I have a number of people in this room I know who are working in Jamaica right now, but I've never been the there. And, but I will say this, is that the Caribbean has a huge role to play in the cannabis industry because it will allow a lot of companies to do what's called, uh, they'll be eligible for something called a Citizens Investment Bureau Passport Program, meaning that if you show up in Antigua Barbuda and say, hi, government, I'd like to give you our IP, I'd also like to talk to you about a distribution agreement, and in return, we're now eligible for your Citizens Investment Bureau Passport Scheme. What is that? I was happy. But the point I'm trying to make is, is yes, you're going to see a lot of places that use the Caribbean for cannabis, just like they're going to use the Caribbean for banking services, which means it's going to be a very central hub either way. Thank you. All right, over here. You're welcome. I had a question about strategic partner. I had a question about strategic partnerships. So you kind of mentioned uh, the tribes. Uh, I had submitted a tokenized, a tribal tokenized asset uh, in California with the collateral being a blunt rolling machine with the idea of com combining tobacco and cannabis. They didn't like the idea, maybe it was too soon. And so I'm curious about your opinions in utilizing uh, Native American tribes in, in North America and combining um, cannabis with, uh, you know, tobacco. So in the eventuality that's normalized, professionalized, do you guys see that as being an option, I know that Germany's probably never going to allow that, but it's popular with spliffs. But do you guys see blunts, you know, tobacco and, and cannabis eventually being combined together? There's a massive tobacco production facility on Six Nations in, in Hamilton outside of Toronto. And uh, if you've ever been there, it's one of the largest production, tobacco production facilities in the world. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think there's much interest in combining tobacco and cannabis uh, in a product, but there is definitely interest in utilizing their infrastructure to produce cannabis to be exported. And yes, cannabis is, or no, excuse me, tobacco, at least in the Supreme Court cases with First Nations, have recognized a very general right to the possession of tobacco for commercial purposes. I forget, it's Vanderpeet, I think was the Supreme Court case where a guy had been stockpiling Tobacco, clearly he was going to sell it, but that was something that First Nations, we have to remember, were doing since time immemorial before Europeans showing up. So it would, that, that type of a scenario fought very nice, or fit very nicely within the existing jurisprudence. And that's why I think cannabis isn't really a, too big of a stone's throw from tobacco. And in fact, it's just one of many natural medicines. And you know, from the work that we've been doing, more of the bands are wanting to not just take on cannabis, but they want psilocybin, you know, the fungi, peyote through the cacti, vines, ayahuasca, like DMT with chacruna, all of these natural practices that I think they will be able to do a whole host of commercial endeavors under food, social, and ceremonial. But thank you for your question. Yeah, and how it's currently done in, in Germany, to buy, there's no possibility because no cannabis patient is smoking uh, cannabis in, in Germany, no. Um, basically what we have is vaporizing option or tea option. Those are the things which are actively uh, known as application methods. And this is a huge problem most of the doctors have because if they're giving medicinal cannabis flowers to a patient, they always have the risk that they are smoking it giving to their uh, grandchildren or something like that. So there's no option, but from a uh, scientific point of view, I think there is a, um, yeah, it, it might be a possibility to use also the tobacco plant to find solutions of, for example, also creating cannabinoids. Um, but that's a very interesting talk we should do uh, maybe afterwards. Hello, hello. Questions? My name is Phil Hardy, Director of Sales with Craft Depot, and um, we're currently contracted by 50 LPs to help with wholesale distribution and creating efficiencies and transparency in that market, LP to LP. Um, my question is specifically for Linus, um, and it's concerning uh, importing into Germany or importing into the EU. I've heard variants of what's acceptable and what's not from a GPP standpoint. So if you have a cultivator, who's GPP compliant and is, uh, is doing their post-harvest in a GPP level, 
can they go into the EU GMP? Because I've understood that there's GACP, and then once they harvest, it has to go into a GMP process. Um, so I'm trying to get some clarity because I hear people saying if it's GPP all the way till it's packaged in kilos, it can move overseas. And I've heard folks that say, no, it has to be GACP at harvest. You cut her down, move it into GMP for your curing, drying, and, uh, and packaging, and then that can move into the EU. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there are a lot of things, a lot of rumors coming around. GACP, is it possible or not? Currently, there is no GACP uh, grown product um, in the German market. So uh, what you need is an EU GMP certified facility. It's the best would be by a, by a German authority. Currently, waiting times are a year, 12 months, uh, at least at our authority where we are working with. Um, then you're, you're safe and can sort of uh, distribute also pre-packaged uh, medicinal cannabis products. Uh, and then all the qualification and the medical approval will be done inside Germany. The uh, products will be then uh, get an additional label on it and you can uh, distribute them in Germany. That's the easiest way. There are now things um, discussed if it's possible to sort of uh, grow GACP uh, uh, certified products have them extracted as an, at an EU GMP certified facility, packaged, labeled, and then sent to Germany, but it's not yet possible. But this is, I think, a feasible solution uh, because GACP is easier and I don't think everything needs to be grown indoors. Greenhouses is an alternative, which is also used in Israel, for example. Gotcha, thank you very much. So then, just for further clarification as well, a GPP cultivator, just with the cultivation license, who then sells to an EU GMP certified processor, who then creates those products and then they can export. Is that a possibility? Is that a, a, a supply chain that works? As I said, every process, so every process, every supply chain is tested itself. So for example, if we are now coming together and uh, you give me an uh, an, an overview of the product you would like to import. I have to get that import license based on those products, um, exactly on all the information, all the lab tests you have. What we do is we usually do a, a, a sample shipment, um, have it tested in Germany and di directly, um, um, yeah, burned, uh, basically, uh, uh, disposed. Um, and then we sort of test all the processes because German authorities feel way more comfortable if they are tested by a German lab and have been tested by a qualified person. So I would always suggest use a, uh, a distributor uh, where you have GMP knowledge and who have already done those sample shipments uh, and understand the process. There are a lot of people running around. Currently there are 13 uh, licensed distributors including us. So uh, be careful who you talk who you talk Good question. To. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Do we have time for one more or is that it? And someone has a brief one. Anyone have a short, short question? Is that you raising your hand over there? All right, here we go. One Better quick, be good. One last Real quick good. question. Please be brief. Do no not pressure. ramble. Be right here. Here we go. Um, just a question about Germany and what Afria is doing. So Afria has a uh, distribution license, one of the one of the 14 in Germany that you spoke of. And from my understanding, Afria is just purchasing products from Switzerland and getting the distribution revenue for it from a, a company called Blossom. And basically they're just getting those companies and flipping them for pennies on the dollar. Um, my question is like, what do you think about that strategy for companies like Afria and yourself long term who are basically using the distribution network to create revenue? Um, so basically what we've set up, I mean, we are solely focused on distribution at the moment. We are doing some scientific work as well with the tobacco, for example. Um, what, where we see ourselves, we see ourselves as an entry gate for Europe. Um, we, of course, can distribute to the pharmacies. We are very well connected to the biggest pharmacies in the cannabis space. We are the only distributor who is part of the network of cannabis uh, uh, pharmacies in Germany. Um, so um, we think we have a good overview of, of the market and sort of know how it's, how it's working out. Currently, the process is not that much regulated that something like this can happen. So e exporting, for example, from, from, uh, from the Switzerland, um, those are mainly, I think, also CBD uh, uh, products, which are sold in Germany as aroma oils. And it clearly has to say that it's not, uh, it should not be taken uh, uh, orally at any time. So what they're currently doing for those aroma oils and CBD is they put it on a, on a pillow and then uh, uh, smell it through the pillow. 
Um, that's, that's how it's currently, sh uh, the application method should be, of course, you can easily take those products. Um, um, but I mean, we have huge problems with the novel food, that's a completely different story. Um, so I think it will be too much to answer that question in this, uh, but I'm more than happy to talk afterwards, yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. Thank you so very much. Let's hear it once again for the panel.